Well, it's it's the democracy at work, and that, and that's what uh, Nunavut is all about. It's about democracy. The premier of Nunavut is out. MLAs there voted to remove Paul Kwasa as premier today. Rather than my son producing healthy red blood cells in his system, he's producing ring blasts of cells with practically nothing in it. A young boy who needs a stem cell transplant needs an indigenous donor. His family hopes someone can help them. So on Monday morning, uh, we woke up to a huge flood. Uh, well, huge. It was uh, water pouring through the windows and uh, through the walls. Yellow knifers should be enjoying the midnight sun. Instead, they're getting drenched with record rain. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. It's a historic day in Nunavut as Paul Kwasa is no longer Premier. Nunavut MLAs voted overwhelmingly to remove Kwasa as Premier today. Our Kent Driscoll was there. This is from Iqaluit. Paul Kwasa has just become Nunavut's shortest serving Premier. In a vote of 13 to 2, Kwasa was voted out of Executive Council by the members of the Consensus Legislative Assembly. That makes him the first ever Premier removed from office. John Main, MLA for RV at Whale Cove, made the motion to remove the Premier from his position in his role as chair of the regular members caucus. There's not been uh, a lot of, um, how shall I put, there's not been a lot of team effort among the members under this Premier. There's been a uh, tendency towards uh, autocratic style of leading, which clashes with our consensus model of government. And uh, the second uh, thing that has been brought up repeatedly is uh, integrity. And uh, there have been misleading statements made to the House regarding the Northern Lights uh, trade show. And there have been uh, misleading statements made uh, going back to the leadership forum in November. For his part, Kwasa defended his record and urged individual members to think of the voters at home. And I think it's very important that we do recognize that we are elected by our constituents. It's, uh, you know, and, and it's our responsibility to ensure that we hear what our constituencies are saying. And that's the message that we have to deliver when we are here. And we do that on a daily basis when we are sitting. And that's, what, that's our role, is to speak what our constituencies are saying. Nunavut's MLAs were somber following the first ever removal of a premier. Nunavut's consensus system is quite unlike a southern system. Those members hugging the former premier are also some of the ones who voted to remove him. Kwasa spoke with reporters immediately following the vote. Well, it's, it's the democracy at work, and, that, and that's what uh, Nunavut is all about. It's about democracy, but certainly everyone has a, has a you know. Nunavut was created with a vision, and, and I'm sure this House will continue that vision. Kwasa plans to stay on as a regular member of the Assembly. A leadership forum to select a new Premier will have to be the next thing the Assembly considers, as under the consensus model of government, Nunavut cannot be without a Premier. The last forum was an all-day affair, so it's still unclear when Nunavut will have that new Premier. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Chalawit. The leader of a national Indigenous organization that is fed up with being snubbed by the federal government is voicing its frustration on Parliament Hill and more specifically to the Senate Standing Committee on Indigenous Peoples. Annette Francis has more. The National Chief of the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples began the meeting with a brief overview of his organization. We have a long history of fighting for the off-reserve Indigenous Peoples of Canada. We established a pivotal role for ourselves at the constitutional table 
Bertrand says CAP was first established in 1971 as the voice of all Indigenous peoples. Then the Métis National Council and the Assembly of First Nations were later formed. He says CAP still represents a large portion of non-status Métis and First Nations people living off reserve, but it hasn't been included in any discussions with the federal government. In a lot of instances, we are, we are sort of pushed aside. The, the federal government will only deal, only deals with certain NIOs and they push some other ones aside, which is, you know, they are doing exactly what was being, you know, they're segregating uh, certain, certain uh, portions of the Indigenous peoples. CAP is the organization that filed court action to force the federal government to recognize its fiduciary duty to Métis and non-status Indians. In 2016, the Supreme Court ruled on what is known as the Daniels decision. But Vice Chief Ron Swain says there has been no movement for citizens in his organization. To combat uh, not having a, that proper uh, table or forum with the federal government and their different provinces, uh, we're basically just organizing. We're organizing and, uh, and having, you know, community meetings, talking about the Daniels in our limited way, in our limited scope. Conservative Senator Dennis Patterson says the intent of today's meeting is to learn how to build a new relationship with Indigenous people. He says he's shocked to hear that CAP has been left out. What do you want us to recommend here on this? Is it simply that the federal government must negotiate with a significant group of uh, Aboriginal people who uh, have so far been left out of the out of the dialogue. Is that is that what we need to recommend? According to National Chief Robert Bertrand, that's exactly what his organization's been hoping for. And at Francis A. Patin National News, Ottawa. A Poplar Hill mother is on a journey to a foster home hundreds of kilometers away where her daughter committed suicide. Epitan's Kenneth Jackson and Willow Fiddler have joined her as she walks for answers. Barbara Sikaski's mornings begin like this, putting on her shoes so she can walk along here. She's a mother who needs closure. I was talking to my husband about this for a long time when I wanted to do this. Barbara is walking to the foster home where her daughter, Kaya Sue Turtle, died by suicide in October of 2016. A couple weeks ago, she started the journey with her son, Winter. Got up and I said I decided I wanted to walk and walk this to Sulacote and go do a closer. closer. The closure? Yeah. yeah. She began her walk by flying from Poplar Hill First Nation to Red Lake and is now just past Dryden. It's about a 320 kilometer walk in total. And when she gets to Sioux Lookout, she's gonna go inside the home for the first time. What's it gonna be like when you get to Sioux Lookout and you have to go in the home? No, I'm just kind of nervous what I'm gonna say, say in that room. The words haven't come to her yet, but she wants to say goodbye. It's, it's kind of hard to let go of something. It really cared about and loved. Kanana had been in the child welfare system for several years. That is until she filmed her death inside a foster home owned and operated by Tikkanagan Child and Family Services. An a Patan investigation found she was clearly suicidal, yet was left alone for 45 minutes the day she died. Tikkanagan has never told Barbara how or why she was left alone that long. But you may have noticed something falling behind Barbara on her walk. I think they want to help you, and there's a van behind us that they're paying for to follow along. Yeah. But yet they won't tell you how your daughter was left alone for 45 minutes that day. Yeah, that's what I mean. I don't know what's, what's, what's the problem with these ticking and They never, they're just, they're just hiding something. I think that's what I think, me too. That's what my family thinks too. Ebertin has asked ticking too, but a spokesperson says they can't say it out of respect of the family's privacy. They also warned AP10 from filming the home where Kanina died, calling it a safe haven for kids. But it was supposed to be Kanina's safe haven too. A day before she died, Kanina was inside this Tim Hortons. She posted a video to her Facebook. I don't know. 
Her mom doesn't know either. She walks with the same iPod her daughter used to film her death. The video is still on the device. She also wears the butterfly necklace Kanina wore the day she died. And she keeps walking for Kanina and for closure. You also want to show Tikkanagan something too, right? Yeah, I, want want to, I wanted to show them how, I, how much I love, loved my daughter so much. So she and her son keep going to Sioux Lookout, where she hopes to find a way she can keep going, not only for herself, but for her four other kids waiting for her back home. Kenneth Jackson, APT National News, Dryden, Ontario. And we'd like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. Police were the focus at Quebec's inquiry into relations with Indigenous people that is currently in the Cree First Nation of Mistissini. Thursday afternoon, they heard testimony from Bertie Wapachi. Wapachi, a 48-year-old Cree man, testified that Quebec Provincial Police specifically target Cree drivers for license and registration checks. Wapachi also testified that police unfairly arrested him as a teenager after a fight outside a bar in the city of Val d'Or and proceeded to assault him back at the station. I still feel something wrong in my armpit somewhere and around my, uh, like under my arm, both, both sides. And I believe it's because what happened in, in, the, uh, in the police station, as one of them grabbed my cuffed hands, my cuffed wrists, and he lifted, lifted my arms uh, as far as up as you could. Today's cost of internet and mobile services in Canada is creating a digital divide. That's according to a new report commissioned by three groups, including the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg. The report concludes that mobile services are unaffordable for low-income people and many minorities, including Indigenous people. Compared to other developed countries, Canada ranked low in terms of affordability. The groups are calling on the CRTC to make cell phone companies create affordable entry-level rate plans. And the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg says such a plan should also extend to internet services. The situation is probably uh, worse in remote and rural communities, right? Because we know already that the broadband connection in many northern communities is, is not uh, what other Canadians have access to, right? So it's an issue of fairness, of, of being reasonable. The Winnipeg family is pleading for a transplant for their son. That story and more coming up after the break, but first, here's a look at Friday's weather. On the East Coast, 5 in St. John's, 18s and sunshine in Charlottetown and Halifax. Kujuak, sunny and 6, 9 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Lots of sun through Quebec, Saguenay and Quebec City looking at 24 degrees. Sunny in southern Ontario, 26 is for Windsor and Sarnia, 22 up in North Bay. Rain and 25 in Big Trout Lake, 19 in Thunder Bay, 21 in Wawa. 18 in rain in Churchill and Thompson, partly sunny and 18 in Norway House. Cloudy in Barrens River and 23, 27 in Gimli Harbour. Sun and cloud in much of Saskatchewan, 21 in North Battleford, Spit Current and Yorkton. Much of the same in the north, 17 in Larage and 18 in Buffalo Narrows, 19 in Stony Rapids. A Winnipeg family is in need of a life-saving transplant for their young son. And while searching for a match, they want to spread awareness to get more Indigenous people to become donors. Ashley Branson has more. And these are all your friends. How many do you have? Four, five, six. Tanner McLeod is an active and happy four and a half year old. At first glance, you wouldn't know he was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder. He has been diagnosed with a rare form of anemia. They call it sideroblastic anemia. Yeah, and apparently there's very few Manitobans that have been diagnosed with it. Miranda McLeod is his mom. 
She learned of his condition at six months old. Rather than my son producing healthy red blood cells in his system, he's producing ring blasts of cells with practically nothing in it. It's unhealthy. He can't use them. It's there no benefit. Tanner's family takes him for regular blood transfusions. On average, that's every three weeks, and it's usually an all-day process that starts with getting needles at 9 o'clock in the morning. He then receives the blood transfusion at about lunchtime, and then it goes on for about two to three hours. Miranda says there is only one cure for her son's condition, a stem cell transplant. Immediate family members were tested but were not a match. She says medical staff think the best match would be someone from his ethnic background. He would be looking through a pool of people with the, the same background, so of Indigenous descent. And right now that makes up about 1.3% of our entire database. Sarah Jasmins is a stem cell territory manager for Canadian Blood Services. She says there's only been a slight increase in Indigenous donors. We know that Canada's database is comprised of about 68% Caucasian and about 32% from diverse ancestry, um, with Indigenous descent being uh, included in that. But we need a network that accurately represents Canada's growing ancestral mosaic because patients are more likely to find donors within their own ancestral groups. Both Miranda and Sarah say spreading the word is crucial. The quickest way to become a donor is to register online. They can go to blood.ca and they just find the little stem cell drop down menu and they can actually fill out their form online and we'll mail them a swabbing kit so they can do their cheek swab and they mail it back to us. And once we receive it, um, we test it and put their HLA markers uploaded onto the registry so that we can potentially match them to any patient in the world. Miranda is hopeful that one of those patients will be her son. I would like to emphasize the, the importance of, of Indigenous people registering on the One Manch Network because not only will it benefit my son, but it could benefit other people, other patients that are suffering from a rare condition. Ashley Branson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Now to a soggy story out of the capital of the Northwest Territories where record-breaking rainfalls have been happening for the past week. It's weather only ducks could love. Today is the fifth day in a row it has rained in Yellowknife. About half a month's worth of rain fell on Monday alone, breaking records. And it's not over yet. More rain is expected in the forecast. The downpours have created a muddy mess of one main street that's currently under construction and flooded out basements. So on Monday morning, uh, we woke up to a huge flood. Uh, well, huge. It was uh, water pouring through the windows and uh, through the walls. My biggest fear is uh, for works to take forever. Um, and uh, maybe if they, I'm, I'm afraid they would find some asbestos, but you know that's that's a common issue, I think, uh, in the older buildings. One of our recent weather forecasts, we didn't know what the temperature was <laughs> in Yellowknife. I guess well, we now know it uh, was. We now know it's wet. the capital of wet. <laughs> A Regina Museum held a blanket exercise to teach Canadian history from an Indigenous perspective. After the break, we'll check in on that. But first, here's the rest of Friday's weather forecast. Northern Alberta, a mix of sun and cloud, 18 in high level, Peace River and Grand Prairie. Rainy in the south, just 15 in Calgary and Lethbridge, 20 in Medicine Hat. A mix of sun and cloud on the west coast, 18 in Victoria, 14 in Port Hardy, 19 in Balakula. Same sort of mix for the interior of northern BC, 17s in Fort St. John and Prince George. The Yukon, 10 up in Old Crow, 20 down in Watson Lake, 21 in Sunshine in Norburn Wells, 16 in Yellowknife and Wati. 
10 and rain in Tech, 7 in Nuvik and Politech. Baker's Lake will be 12, but just 4 in Whale Cove and Arbiat. Lots of sun further north, 5 in Clyde River, 3 in Igloolik and Iqaluit. The Royal Saskatchewan Museum in Regina is celebrating National Indigenous History Month. This week they had a blanket exercise which teaches Canadians history from an Indigenous perspective. APTN's Chris Stewart was there. And we'd like you to still stay in the circle if you wish, but if you feel like you need to come out, just, you know, have a seat. About the blanket this blanket exercise is a learning experience that tells 500 years of Indigenous history in an hour. From the time settlers arrived to today, the audience participates. Those with white cards, please hold them up. You represent people who died after coming into contact with many of these diseases. Please step off, step off the blankets. They stand on blankets representing Indigenous land. They represent the land base that we originally would have held. And as we go through the experience and we have people sort of being, um, stepping out of the blanket to represent the um, people, you know, dying of disease or, you know, being taken away through um, to the residential schools, the, the blankets begin to shrink. It shows that the, how the land base sh shrinks in terms of the people, you know, being on their original lands. From the Indian Act, the loss of the buffalo, residential schools to the past system and child welfare, the blanket exercise is a strong teaching tool. For those who have never participated before and those who have taken part many times, it is Joni Sundin's first time. It is a lot of history in a short period of time. I think it more teaches you you want to learn more. Um, I'm actually surprised how many people came out. This is showing that the public wants to be educated. They want to learn. You lived in hundreds of nations and communities. You fished and hunted and farmed. Each community had its own language, culture, traditions, laws, and governments. For Audrey Yapes, this is her eighth blanket exercise. She says it helps her with the memories of residential schools. It's a part of a healing journey for me. It's part of me trying to understand, understanding myself, to pass it on to my children and my grandchildren, what I had experienced in residential school and I also bring it to my work and share it with my community. It's a history that's not that's not not been told for a variety of reasons and I mean it's a history that's out there. Okay, so Audrey Yape says she will be back for more. Off. I could do it again yes yeah until I tell those tears quit coming yeah. The Royal Saskatchewan Museum continues National Indigenous History Month with events throughout June. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Regina. Quite the museum there in Regina. Yes. <laughs> that is Lots your going on. APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night. And I'm Dennis Ward. Melissa will be back here tomorrow. Have a good night.